The Seen Society by Eric Fromm, Chapter 6, Various Other Diagnoses, 19th Century. The diagnosis of the illness of present-day Western culture, as we tried to give it in the previous chapter, is by no means new. Its only claim toward furthering the understanding of the problem is the attempt to apply the concept of alienation more empirically to various observable phenomena, and to establish the connection between the illnesses of alienation and the humanistic concept of human nature and mental health. In fact, it is most remarkable that a critical view of 20th century society was already held by a number of thinkers living in the 19th century, long before the symptom symptomatology which seems so apparent today had become fully manifest. It is also remarkable that their critical diagnosis and prognosis should have so much in common among themselves and with critics of the 20th century. The prognosis of the decay and barbarism into which the 20th century will sink was made by people of the most varied philosophical and political views. The Swiss conservative Burkhardt, the Russian religious radical Tolstoy, the French anarchist Proudhon, as well as his conservative compatriot Baudelaire, the American anarchist Thoreau, and later his more politically minded compatriot Jack London, the German revolutionary Karl Marx. They all agreed in the most severe criticism of the modern culture, and most of them visualized the possibility of the advent of an age of barbarism. Marx's predictions were mitigated by his assumption that socialism was a possible and even probable alternative to it. Burkhardt, from his conservative perspective, colored by the Swiss capacity for a stubborn refusal to be impressed by words and glamour, stated in a letter written in 1876 that perhaps Europe might still enjoy a few peaceful decades before it transformed itself by a number of terrible wars and revolutions into a new kind of imperium, a new kind of imperium rom romanum into a military and economic despotism. The 20th century is chosen for everything else but for a true democracy. In 1872, Burkhart writes to a friend, I have a premonition, which still sounds like folly, and yet it will not leave me alone. The military state must become a big industrialist. Those concentrations of people in the big workshop workshops must not forever be left to their greed and want. The logical consequence would be a predetermined and supervised amount of misery with advancement and in uniform, begun and completed daily with the accompaniment of drums. There's the prospect of long and, and voluntary submission to single leaders and usurpers. The people no longer believe in principles, but will probably periodically believe in saviors. Because of this reason, authority will again raise its head in the delightful 20th century, and a frightful head it will be. <clears throat> in his prediction of systems like fascism and Stalinism for the 20th century, Burkhardt differs little from the predictions of the revolutionary Proudhon. The threat for the future is, Proudhon writes, a compact democracy having the appearance of being founded on the dictatorship of the masses, but in which the masses have no more power than is necessary to ensure a general serfdom in accordance with the following precepts and principles borrowed from the old absolutism. Indivisibility of public power, all-consuming centralization, systematic destruction of all individual, corporative, and regional thought, regarded as disruptive. Inquisitorial police. We should no longer deceive ourselves, he wrote. Europe is sick of thought and order. It is entering into an era of brute force and contempt of principles. And later on, then the great war of the six great powers will begin. Carnage will come and the enfeeblement that will follow these bloodbaths will be terrible. We shall not live to see the work of the new age. We shall fight in the darkness. We must prepare ourselves to endure this life without too much sadness by doing our duty. Let us help one another, call to one another in the gloom, and practice justice wherever opportunity offers. <clears throat> and finally, 
Today's civilization is in the grip of a crisis for which one can only find a single analogy in history. That is the crisis which brought the coming of Christianity. All the traditions are worn out, all the creeds abolished, but the new program is not yet ready, by which I mean that it has not yet entered the consciousness of the masses. Hence what I call the dissolution. This is the cruelest moment in the life of societies. I am under no illusions and do not expect to wake up one morning to see the resurrection of freedom in our country as if by a stroke of magic. No, no, decay and decay for a period whose end I cannot fix and which will last for not less than one or two generations is our lot. I shall witness the evil only. I shall die in the midst of darkness. While Burkhardt and Proudhon visualized fascism and Stalinism as the outcome of 19th century culture, a prophecy repeated more specifically in 1907 by Jack London in his Iron Heel, others center the, centered their diagnosis on the spiritual poverty and alienation of contemporary society, which, according to them, must lead to an increasing dehumanization and decay of culture. How similar are two statements made by two authors as different from each other as Baudelaire and Tolstoy? Baudelaire writes in 1851 in some fragments entitled Fousse, The world is drawing to a close. Only for one reason can it last longer, just because it happens to exist. But how weak a reason is this compared with all that forebodes the contrary, particularly with the question, what is left to the world of man in the future? Supposing it should continue materially, would that be an existence worthy of its name and of the historical dictionary? I do not say the world would fall back into a spectral condition in the odd disorder of South American republics, nor do I say that we should return to primitive savagery, and, with a rifle in our arms, hunt for food through the grass-covered ruins of our civilization. No, such adventures would still call for a certain vital energy an echo from primordial times. We shall furnish a new example of the inexorability of the spiritual and moral laws and shall be their new victims. We shall perish by the very thing by which we fancy that we live. Techno tech technocracy will Americanize us. Pro progress will starve our spirituality so far that nothing of the bloodthirsty, frivolous, or unnatural dreams of the utopist will be comparable to those positive facts. I invite any thinking person to show me what is left of life, religion. It is useless to talk about it or to look for its remnants. It is a scandal that one takes the trouble even of denying God. Private property. It was, strictly speaking, abolished with the suppression of the right of primogen primogenitor. Yet the time will come when mankind, like a vet like a revengeful cannibal, will snatch the last piece from those who rightfully deemed themselves the heirs of revolutions. And even this will not be the worst. Universal ruin will manifest itself not solely or particularly in political institutions or general progress or whatever else might be a proper name for it. It will be seen above all in the baseness of hearts. Shall I add that that little leftover of sociability will hardly resist the sweeping brutality and that the rulers, in order to hold their own and to produce a sham order, will ruthlessly resort to measures which will make us, who already are callous, shudder. Tolstoy wrote some years later, The medieval theology, or the Roman corruption of morals, poisoned only their own people, a small part of mankind. Today, electricity, railways, and telegraphs spoil the whole world. Everyone makes these things his own. He simply cannot help making them his own. Everyone suffers in the same way, is forced to the same extent to change his way of life. All are under the necessity of betraying what is most important for their lives, the, under the understanding of life itself, religion. Machines to produce what? The telegraph to, to dispatch what? Books, papers, to spread what kind of news? Railways to go to whom and to what place? Millions of people herded together and subject to a supreme power to accomplish what? Hospitals, physicians, dispensaries in order to prolong life. For what? How easily do individuals as well as whole nations take their own so-called civilization 
as the true civilization. Finishing one's studies, keeping one's nails clean, using the tailors and the barber's services, traveling abroad and the most civilized man is complete. And with regard to nations, as many real ways as possible, academies, industrial works, battleships, forts, newspapers, books, parties, parliaments. Thus, the most civilized nation is complete. Enough individuals, therefore, as well as nations, can be interested in civilization, but not in true enlightenment. The former is easy and meets with approval. The latter requires rigorous efforts, and therefore, from the great majority, always meets with nothing but contempt and hatred, for it exposes the lie of civilization. Less drastic, yet just as clear as the foregoing writers, is Thoreau's criticism of modern culture. In his life without principle, he says, let us consider the way in which we spend our lives. This world is a place of business. What an infinite bustle. I am awakened almost every night by the panting of the locomotive. It interrupts my dreams. There is no Sabbath. It would be glorious to see mankind at leisure for once. It is nothing but work, work, work. I cannot easily buy a blank book to write thoughts in. They are commonly ruled for dollars and cents. An Irishman, seeing me making a minute in the fields, took it for granted that I was calculating my wages. If a man was tossed out of a window when, it, when an infant and so made a cripple for life or scared out of his wits by the Indians, it is regretted chiefly because he was thus incapacitated for business. I think that there is nothing, not even crime, more opposed to poetry, to philosophy, a to life itself, than this incessant business. If a man walk in the woods for love of them half of each day, he is in danger of being regarded as a loafer, but if he spends his whole day as a speculator, shearing off those woods and making earth bald before her time, he is esteemed an industrious and enterprising citizen, as if a town had no interest in its forests but to cut them down. The ways by which you may get money almost without exception lead downward. To have done anything by which you earned money merely is to have been truly idle or worse. If the laborer gets no more than the wages which his employer pays him, he is cheated. He cheats himself. If you would get money as a writer or a lecturer, you must be popular, which is to go down perpendicularly. The aim of the laborer should be not to get his living, to get a good job, but to perform well a certain work, and even in a pecu pecuniary sense, it would be economy for a town to pay its laborers so well that they would not feel that they were working for low ends as for a livelihood merely, but for scientific or even moral ends. Do not hire a man who does your work for money, but him who does it for love of it. The ways in which most men get their living, that is, live, are mere makeshifts and a shirking of the real business of life, chiefly because they do not know, but partly because they do not mean any better. In summing up his views, he says, America is said to be the arena on which the battle of freedom is to be fought, but surely it cannot be freedom in a merely political sense that is meant. Even if we grant that the American has freed himself from a political tyrant, he is still the slave of an economical and moral tyrant. Now that the Republic, the Res Publica, has been settled, it is time to look after the Res Privata, the private state, to see, as the Roman Senate charged its consuls, ne quid res privata detrimenti caberet, that the private state received no detriment. <clears throat> Do we call this land... Do we call this the land of the free? What is it to be free from King George and continue the slaves of King Prejudice? What is it to be born free and not to live free? What is the value of any political freedom, but as a means to moral freedom? Is it a freedom to be slaves or a freedom to be free, of which we boast? We are a nation of politicians concerned about the outmost defenses only of freedom. It is our children's children who may perchance be really free. We tax ourselves unjustly. There's a part of us which is not represented. It is taxation without representation. We quarter troops, we quarter fools and cattle. 
of all sorts upon ourselves. We quarter our gross bodies on our poor souls till the former eat up all the latter's substance. Those things which now most engage the attention of men as politics in the daily routine are, it is true, vital functions of human society, but should be unconsciously performed, like the corresponding functions of the physical body. They are infrahuman, a kind of vegetation. I sometimes awake to a half-consciousness of them going on about me, as a man may become conscious of some of the process of, dig of digestion in a morbid state. And so have the dyspepsia, as it is called. It is as if a thinker submitted himself to be rasped by the, by the great gizzard of creation. Politics is, as it were, the gizzard of society, full of grit and gravel, and the two political parties are its own are its two opposite halves, sometimes split into quarters, it may be, which grind on each other. Not only individuals but states have thus a confirmed dyspepsia dyspepsia, which expresses itself, you can imagine, by what sort of eloqu eloquence. Thus our life is not altogether a forgetting, but also, alas, to a great extent, a remembering of that which we should never have been conscious of, certainly not in our waking hours. Why should we not meet, not always at dyspeptics, to tell our bad dreams, but sometimes as eupeptics, to congratulate each other on the ever-glorious morning, I do not make an exorbitant demand, surely. One of the most penetrating diagnoses of the capitalist culture in the 19th century was made by a sociologist, E. Durkham, who was neither a political nor a religious radical. He states that in modern industrial society, the individual and the group have ceased to function satisfactorily, that they live in a condition of anomie, that is, a lack of meaningful and structuralized social life. <clears throat> that the individual follows more and more a restless movement, a planless self-development, an aim of living which has no criterion of value, and in which happiness lies always in the future and never in any present achievement. The ambition of man having the whole world for his customer becomes unlimited, and he is filled with disgust, with the futility of endless pursuit. Durkham points out that only the political state survived the French Revolution, as a solitary factor of collective organization. As a result, a genuine social order has disappeared, the state emerging as the only collective organizing activity of a social character. The individual, free from all genuine social bonds, finds himself abandoned, isolated, and demoralized. Society becomes a disorganized dust of individuals. 20th century. Turning now to the 20th century, there's also a remarkable similarity in the criticisms and diagnosis of the mental, mental ill health of contemporary society, just as in the 19th century, remarkable particularly in view of the fact that it comes from people with different philosophical and political views. Although I leave out from this survey most of the socialist critics of the 19th and 20th centuries, because I shall deal with them separately in the next chapter, I shall begin here with the views of the British socialist R. H. Tawney, because they are in many ways related to the views expressed in this book. In his classic work, The Acquisitive Society, originally published under the title The Sickness of an Acquisitive Society, he points to the fact that the principle on which capitalistic society is based is the domination of man by things. In our society, he says, even sensible men are persuaded that capital employs labor, such as our pagan ancestors imagined, that the other pieces of wood and iron, which they deified in their day, sent their crops and won their battles. When men have gone so far as to talk, as though their idols have come to life, it is time that someone broke them. Labor consists of persons, capital of things. The only use of things is to be applied to the service of persons. He points out that the worker in modern industry does not give his best energies because he lacks an interest in his work, owing to his non-participation and control. He postulates, as the only way out of the crisis of modern society, a change in moral values. It is necessary to assign to economic activity itself its proper place as the servant, not a master of society, 
the burden of our civilization is not merely, as many suppose, that the product of industry is ill-distributed, or its conduct tyrannical, or its operation interrupted by embittered disagreements. It is that industry itself has come to hold a position of exclusive predominance among human interests, which no single interest, and least of all the provision of the material means of existence, is fit to occupy. Like a hypochondriac who is so absorbed in the processes of his own digestion that he goes to his grave before he has begun to live, industrialized communities neglect the very objects for which it is worth, uh, for which it is worthwhile to acquire riches in their feverish preoccupation with the means by which riches can be acquired. That obsession by economic issues is as local and transitory as it is repulsive and disturbing. To future generations, it will appear as pitiable as the obsession of the 17th century by religious quarrels appear today. Indeed, it is less rational, since the object with which it is concerned is less important, and it is a poison which inflames every wound and turns each trivial scratch into a malignant ulcer. Society will not solve the particular problems of industry which afflict it until that poison is expelled and it has learned to see industry itself in the right perspective. If it is to do that, it must rearrange its scale of values. It must regard economic interests as one element in life, not as the whole of life. It must persuade its members to renounce the opportunity of gains which accrue without any corresponding service because the struggle for them keeps the whole community in a fever. It must so organize industry that the instrumental character of economic activity is emphasized by its subordination to the social purpose for which it is carried on. One of the most outstanding contemporary students of the industrial civilization in the United States, Elton Mayo, shared, although somewhat more cautiously, Durkham's viewpoint. It is true, he said, that the problem of social disorganization with its consequent enemy probably exists in a more acute form in Chicago than in other parts of the United States. It is probable that it is a more immediate issue in the United States than in Europe, but it is a problem of order and social development with which the world is concerned. Discussing the modern preoccupation with, it, with economic activities, Mayo says, just as our political and economic studies have for 200 years tended to take account only of the economic functions involved in living, so also in our actual living we have inadvertently allowed pursuit of economic development to lead us in a condition of extensive social disintegration. It is probable that the work a man does represents his most important function in the society. But unless there is some sort of integral social background to his life, he cannot even assign a value to his work. Durkham's findings in 19th century France would seem to apply to 20th century America, referring to his comprehensive study of the attitude of the Hawthorne workers towards their work, he comes to the following conclusion. The failure of workers and supervisors to understand that their work and working conditions, the widespread sense of personal futility, is general to the civilized world, and not merely characteristic of Chicago. The belief of the individual in his social function and solidarity with the group, his capacity for collaboration in work, these are disappearing, destroyed in part by rapid scientific and technical advance. With this belief, his sense of security and of well-being also vanishes. He begins to manifest those exaggerated demands of life which Durkham has described. Mayo not only agrees with Durkham in the essential point of his diagnosis, but he also comes to the critical conclusion that in the half-century of scientific effort after Durkham, very little progress has been made in the understanding of the problem. Whereas, he writes, in the material and scientific spheres, we have been careful to develop knowledge and technique in the human and sociopolitical. We have content, contented ourselves with haphazard, guess, and opportunist fumbling. And further, we are faced with the fact that then, that in the important domain of human understanding and control, we are ignorant of the facts and their nature. Our opportunism in administration and social inquiry has left us incapable of anything but impotent inspection of a cumulative disaster. 
so we are compelled to wait for the social organism to recover or perish without adequate medical aid. Speaking more specifically of the backwardness of our political theory, he states, political theory has tended to relate itself for the most part to its historic origins. It has failed to originate and sustain a vigorous inquiry into the changing structure of society. In the meantime, the social context, the actual condition of civilized peoples, has undergone so great a variety of changes that any mere announcement of the ancient formulae rings hollow and carries no conviction to anyone. Another thoughtful student of the contemporary social scene, F. Tenenbaum, arrives at conclusions which are not unrelated to those of Tawny. In spite of the fact that Tannenbaum emphasizes the central role of the trade union in contrast to Tawny's socialist insistence on the direct participation of the workers. Concluding his philosophy of labor, Tenenbaum writes, um, The major error of the last century has been the assumption that a total society can be organized upon an economic motive, upon profit. The trade union has proved that notion to be false. It has demonstrated once again that men do not live by bread alone. Because the corporation can offer only bread or cake, it has proved incompetent to meet the demands for the good life. The union, with all its faults, may yet save the corporation and its great efficiencies by incorporating it, incorporating it into its own natural society, its own cohesive labor force and by endowing it with the meanings that all real societies possess, meanings that give some substance of idealism to man in his journey between the cradle and the grave. Those meanings cannot be embraced by expanding the economic motive. If the corporation is to survive, it will have to be endowed with a moral role in the world, not merely an economic one. From this point of view, the challenge to management by the trade union is salutary and hopeful. It is a route, perhaps the only available one, for saving the values of our democratic society and the contemporary industrial system as well. In some way, the corporation and its labor force must become one corporate group and cease to be a house divided and seemingly at war. Lewis Mumford, with whose writings my own ideas have many points in common, says this about our contemporary civilization. The most deadly criticism one could make of modern civilization is that apart from its man-made crises and catastrophes, it is not humanly interesting. In the end, such a civilization can produce only a mass man, incapable of choice, incapable of spontaneous, self-directed activities. At best, patient, docile, disciplined to monotonous work to an almost pathetic degree but increasingly irresponsible as his choices become fewer and fewer. Finally, a creature governed mainly by his conditioned reflexes, the ideal type desired, if never quite achieved by the advertising agency and the sales organizations of modern business, or by the propaganda office and the planning bureaus of totalitarian and quasi-totalitarian governments. The handsomest encomium for such creatures is they do not make trouble. The highest virtue is they do not stick their necks out. Ultimately, such a society produces only two groups of men, the conditioners and the conditioned, the active and the passive barbarians. The exposure of this web of falsehood, self-deception, and emptiness is perhaps what made Death of a Salesman so poignant to the metropolitan American audiences that witnessed it. Now, this mechanical chaos is plainly not self-perpetuating, for it affronts and humiliates the human spirit, and the tighter and more efficient it becomes as a mechanical system, the more stubborn will be the human reaction against it. Eventually, it must drive modern man to blind rebellion, to suicide, or to renewal, and so far it has worked in the first two ways. On this analysis, the crisis we now face would be inherent in our culture, even if, even if it had not, by some miracle, also unleashed the more active disintegrations that have taken place in recent history. A. R. Um, Huron, a convinced supporter of capitalism and a writer with a much more conservative bent than the ones quoted so far, nevertheless comes to critical conclusions which are essentially very close to those of Durkheim and Mayo. 
In his Why Men Work, a 1948 selection of the Executive Book Club of New York, he writes, It is fantastic to picture a great multitude of workers committing mass suicide because of boredom, a sense of, fut a sense of futility, and frustration. But the fantastic nature of the picture disappears when we broaden our concept of suicide beyond the killing of the physical life of the body. The human being who has resigned himself to a life devoid of thinking, ambition, pride, and personal achievement has resigned himself to the death of, it, of attributes which are distinctive elements of human life. Filling a space in the factory or office with his physical body, making motions designed by the minds of others, applying physical strength, or releasing the power of steam or electricity are not in themselves con contributions of the essential abilities of human beings. This inadequate demand upon human abilities can be no more, no more forcibly indicated than by reference to modern techniques for the placement of workers. Experience has shown that there are jobs, a startling number of them, which cannot be satisfactorily filled by persons of average or superior intelligence. It is... It is... Um, I lost my spot. It is no answer to say that large numbers of persons with inferior intelligence needs the, need the jobs. Management shares responsibility with statesmen, ministers, and educators for the improvement of the intelligence of all of us. We shall always be governed in a democracy by the votes of people as people, including, including those whose native intelligence is low, or whose potential mental and spiritual development have been cramped. We must never abandon the material benefits we have gained from technology and mass production and specialization of tasks. But we shall never achieve the ideals of America if we create a class of workers denied the satisfactions of significant work. We shall not be able to maintain those ideals if we do not apply every tool of government, education, and industry to the improvement of the human abilities of those who are our rulers, the tens of millions of ordinary men and women. The part of this task assigned to management is the provision of working conditions which will release the creative instinct of every worker and which will give play which will give play to his divine human ability to think. After having heard the voices of various social scientists, let us conclude this chapter by listening to three men outside of the field of social science A. Huxley, A. Schweitzer, and A. Einstein. Huxley's indictment of 20th century capitalism is contained in his Brave New World. In this novel, from 1931, he describes a picture of an aut automatized world, which is clearly insane, and yet which only in details, and somewhat in degree, is different from the reality of 1954. The only alternative he sees is the life of the savage with a religion which is half-fertility cult and half penitent ferocity. In a foreword written for the new edition of The Brave New World in 1946, he writes, Assuming then that we are capable of learning as much from Hiroshima as our forefathers learned from Magdeburg, we may look forward to a period, not indeed of peace, but of limited and only partially ruinous warfare. During that period, it may be assumed that nuclear energy will be harnessed to industrial uses. The result, pretty obviously, will be a series of economic and social changes unprecedented in rapidity and completeness. All the existing patterns of human life will be disrupted, and new patterns will have to be improvised to conform with the non-human fact of atomic power. pro in modern dress, I don't know that word, the nuclear scientist will prepare the bed on which mankind must lie and if mankind doesn't fit well that will be just too bad for mankind what lost my spot there will have to be some stretching and a bit of amputation the same sort of stretching and amputation as have been going on ever since 
applied science really got into its stride. Only this time they will be a good deal more drastic than in the past. <clears throat> These far from painless operations will be directed by highly centralized totalitarian governments. Inevitably so, for the immediate future is likely to resemble the immediate past and in the immediate past, rapid technological changes taking place in a mass-producing economy and among a population predominantly propertyless have always tended to produce economic and social confusion. To deal with confusion, power has been centralized and government control increased. It is probable that all the world's governments will be more or less completely totalitarian even before the harnessing of atomic energy. That they will be totalitarian during and after the harnessing seems almost certain. Only a large-scale popular movement toward decentralization and self-help can arrest the present tendency toward statism. At present, there is no sign that such a movement will take place. There is, of course, no reason why the new totalitarianisms should resemble the old. Government by clubs and firing squads by artificial famine, mass imprisonment, and mass deportation is not merely inhumane. Nobody cares much about that nowadays. It is demonstrably inefficient, and in an age of advanced technology, inefficiency is the sin against the Holy Ghost. A really efficient totalitarian state would be one in which the all-powerful executive of political bosses and their army of managers control a population of slaves who do not have to be coerced because they love their servitude. Oh, shit. To make them love it is the task assigned in present-day totalitarian states to ministries of propaganda, newspaper editors, and school teachers, but their methods are still crude and unscientific. The old Jesuits boast that if they were given the schooling of the child, they could answer for the man's religious opinions, was a product of wishful thinking, and the modern pedagogue is probably rather less efficient at conditioning his pupils' reflexes than were the rever reverend fathers who educated Voltaire. The greatest triumphs of propaganda have been accomplished, not by doing something, but by refraining from doing. Great is the truth, but still greater from a practical point of view is silence about truth. By simply not mentioning certain objects, by lowering what Mr. Churchill calls an iron curtain, between the masses and such facts or arguments as the local political bosses regard as undesirable, totalitarian propagandists have influenced opinion much more effectively than they could have done by the most eloquent denunciations, the most compelling of logical rebuttals. But silence is not enough. If, persecu if persecution, liquidation, and other symptoms of social friction are to be avoided, the positive sides of propaganda must be made as effective as the negative. The most important Manhattan projects of the future will be vast government-sponsored inquiries into what the politicians and the participating scientists will call the problem of happiness. In other words, the problem of making people love their servitude. Without economic security, the love of servitude cannot possibly come into existence. For the sake of brevity, I assume that the all-powerful executive and its managers will succeed in solving the problem of permanent security. But security tends very quickly to be taken for granted. Its achievement is merely a superficial external revolution. The love of servitude cannot be established except as the result of a deep personal revolution in human minds and bodies. To bring about that revolution, we require, among others, the following discoveries and inventions. First, a greatly improved technique of suggestion through infant conditioning and, later, with the aid of drugs such scopolamine, or such as scopolamine. Second, a fully developed science of human differences, enabling government managers to assign any given individual to his or her proper place in the social and economic hierarchy. Round pegs and square holes tend to have dangerous thoughts about the social system and to infect others with their discontents. Third, since reality, however utopian, is something from which people feel the need of taking pretty frequent holidays, a substitute for alcohol and the other narcotics, something at once less harmful and more pleasure-giving than gin or heroin. And fourth, 
but this would be a long-term project, which would take generations of totalitarian control to bring to a successful conclusion, a foolproof system of eugenics designed to standardize the human product, and so to facilitate the task of the managers. In Brave New World, this standardization of the human product has been pushed to fantastic, though not perhaps impossible, extremes. Um, technically and ideologically, we are still a long way from bottled babies and Bokanovsky groups of semi-morons. But by AF600, who knows what may not be happening? Meanwhile, the other characteristic features of that happier and more stable world, the equivalence of Soma and Hypnopedia and the scientific caste system, are probably not more than three or four generations away. Nor does the sexual promiscuity of Brave New World seem so very distant. There are already certain American cities in which the number of divorces is equal to the number of marriages. <clears throat> in a few years, no doubt, marriage licenses will be sold like dog licenses, good for a period of 12 months, with no law against changing dogs or keeping more than one animal at a time. Man, this dude is so old and conservative. Needs to chill out. As political and economic freedom diminishes, sexual freedom tends um, compensatingly to increase. And the dictator, and the dictator, unless he needs cannon fodder and families with which to colonize empty or conquer territory, would do well to encourage that freedom. In conjunction with the freedom to daydream under the influence of dope and movies and the radio, it will help to reconcile his subjects to the servitude which is their fate. All things considered, it looks as though Utopia were far closer to us than anyone, only 15 years ago, could have imagined. Then I projected it 600 years into the future. Today, it seems quite possible that the horror may be upon us with a single century. That is, if we refrain from blowing ourselves to smithereens in the interval. Indeed, unless we choose to decentralize and to use applied science. Oh, because this is like a three-page quote. <sighs> it's stupid. Not as the end to which human beings are to be made the means, but as the means to producing a race of free individuals. We have only two alternatives to choose from. Either a number of national, militarized totalitarianisms, having as their root the terror of the atomic bomb and as their consequence the destruction of civilization, or if the warfare is limited, the perpetuation of militarism, or else one supranational totalitarianism, called into existence by the social chaos resulting from rapid technological progress in general, and the atom revolution in particular, and developing under the need for efficiency and stability into the welfare tyranny of utopia. You pays your money and you takes your choice. Albert Schweitzer and Albert Einstein, who perhaps more than any living person manifest the highest development of the intellectual and moral traditions of Western culture, have this to say on present day culture. Albert Schweitzer writes, a new public opinion must be created privately and unobtrusively. The existing one is maintained by the press by propaganda, by organization, and by financial and other influences, which are, at all, which are at its disposal. This unnatural way of spreading ideas must be opposed by the natural one, which goes from man to man and relies solely on the truth of our thoughts and the hearer's receptiveness for new truth. Unarmed and following the human spirit's primitive and natural fighting method, it must attack the other, which faces it, as Goliath faces David, in the mighty armor of the age. About the struggle, which must, which must needs ensue no historical analogy can tell us much. The past has, no doubt, seen the struggle of the free-thinking individual against the fettered spirit of a whole society, but the problem has never presented itself on the scale on which it does today, because the fettering of the collective spirit as it is fettered today by modern organizations modern unreflectiveness and modern popular passions is a phenomenon without precedent in history. 
will the man of today have strength to carry out what the spirit demands from him and what the age would like to make impossible? In the over-organized societies which in a hundred ways have him in their power, he must somehow become one once more an independent personality and so exert influence back upon them. They will use every means to keep him in that condition of impersonality which suits them. They fear personality because the spirit and the truth which they would like to muzzle find in it a means of expressing themselves, and their power is, unfortunately, as great as their fear. There's a tragic alliance between society as a whole and its economic conditions. With a grim relentlessness, those conditions tend to bring up the man of today as a being without freedom, without self-collectedness, without independence, in short, as a human being so full of deficiencies that he lacks the qualities of humanity, and they are the last things that we can change. Even if it should be granted us that the spirit should begin its work, we shall only slowly and incompetently gain power over these forces. There is, in fact, being demanded from the will that which our conditions of life refuse to allow. And how heavy the tasks that the spirit has to take in hand and has to create the power of understanding the truth that is really true, where at present nothing is current but propagandist truth. It has to depose ignoble patriotism and enthrone the noble kind of patriotism which aims at ends that are worthy of the whole of mankind in circles where the hopeless issues of past and present political activities keep nationalist passions aglow even among those who in their hearts would fain to be free from them. This is another like several pages of one quotation. This is bad writing. It has to get the fact that civilization is an interest of all men and end of humanity as a whole, recognized again in places where national civilization is today worshipped as an idol, and the notion of a humanity with a common civilization lies broken to fragments. It has to maintain our faith in the civilized state, even though our modern states, spiritually and economically ruined by the war, have no time to think about the tasks of civilization, and dare not devote their attention to anything but how to use every possible means even those which undermine the conception of justice, to collect money with which to prolong their own existence. It has to unite us by giving us a single ideal of civilized men, and this in a world where one nation has robbed its neighbor of all faith in humanity, idealism, righteousness, reasonableness, and truthfulness, and all alike have come under the domination of powers which are plunging us ever deeper into barbarism. It has to get attention concentrated on civilization while the growing difficulty of making a living absorbs the masses more and more in material cares and makes all other things seem to them to be mere shadows. It has to give us faith it has to give us faith in the possibility of progress while the reaction of the economic on the spiritual becomes more pernicious every day and contributes to an ever growing demoralization. It has to provide us with reasons for hope at a time when when not only secular and religious institutions and associations, but the men too, who are looked upon as leaders continually fail us when artists and men of learning show themselves as supporters of barbarism and notabilities who pass for thinkers and behave outward- outwardly as such are revealed when crises come as being nothing more than writers and members of academies all these hindrances stand in the path of the will to civilization a dull despair hovers about us How well we now understand the men of the Greco-Roman decadence who stood before events incapable of resistance and leaving the world to its fate. Withdrew upon their inner selves. Like them, we are bewildered by our experience of life. Like them, we hear enticing voices which say to us that the only thing which can still make life tolerable is to live for the day. We must, we are told, renounce every wish to think or hope about anything beyond our own fate. We must find rest in resignation. The recognition that civilization is founded on some sort of theory of the universe can be restored only through spiritual awakening, and a will for ethical good in the mass of mankind compels us to make clear to ourselves those difficulties in the way of a rebirth of civilization which ordinary reflection would overlook. But at the same time, it raises us above all considerations of possibility or impossibility. If the ethical spirit provides a sufficient standing ground in the sphere of events for making civilization a reality, then we shall get back to civilization. If we return to a suitable theory of the universe and the convictions to which this properly gives birth. 
In a short article, Why Socialism, Einstein writes, I have now reached the point where I may indicate briefly that to me, that to me constitutes the essence of the crisis of our time. It concerns the relationship of the individual to society. The individual has become more conscious than ever of his dependence upon society, but he does not experience this dependence as a positive asset, as an organic tie, as a protective force, but rather as a threat to his natural rights, or even to his economic existence. Moreover, his position in society is such that the egotistical drives of his, of his makeup are constantly being accentuated, while his social drives, which are by nature weaker, progressively deteriorate. All human beings, whatever their position in society, are suffering from this process of deterioration. Unknowingly prisoners of their own egotism, they feel insecure, lonely, and deprived of the naive, simple, and unsophisticated enjoyment of life. Man can find meaning in life, short and perilous as it is, only through devoting himself to society. That's the end of the chapter. So, turns out Eric Fromm is a shitty writer.